Cool. So uh, first, thank you, everybody, for letting me come out and talk. I uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity. Um, I like to talk a lot, so hopefully, uh, hopefully, at least you, something will come out of this. So the name of the talk here is Modern Policy Management. Um, it's placing responsibility where it belongs. Uh, but the way I really like to think about it, it's really automating responsibility where it belongs. And we'll get into a little bit more about what that means. So to kind of start out with, uh, my name is Mike Enzer. Um, you can probably tell I'm not Finnish. Um, I come from the United States. Uh, my company was acquired uh, about a year ago now uh, from Seattle, Washington. Um, and I ended up moving here uh, to kind of help start the uh, cloud practice for our company. Uh, so I ended up traveling all around, uh, all over EMEA and uh, helping clients and helping our customers and, uh, and our own employees uh, kind of adopt cloud native technology. Um, I've been doing software for over 25 years professionally. Um, I mashed keyboards before that, but I wouldn't call it actually programming. Um, I broke a lot of things. Um, I was, uh, you know, been everything all across, you know, computer stuff. I've been looking on this lifelong quest to figure out how, as a developer, can I, you know, minimize the amount of uh, effort it takes in order to deliver the code? Because at the end of the day, as a developer, I just want to code. That's all I want to do. But inevitably, that keeps backing up further and further when you get into infrastructure and stuff. So, I was an original beta tester for Google App Engine in 2008. I was also on the beta program for Cloud Foundry as well at the same time, and then I've been kind of following that pursuit ever since. Um, I'm not just a not just a tech guy. I am a home brewer. I've been brewing beer for about 14 years now, so I even got my nice little microbrew up here, which is nice, um, and I do various other things. So, uh, what, what's on tap for today? Um, I want to talk through uh, a little bit more about what policies are and kind of baseline uh, what a policy is. We'll talk more on the uh, kind of the historical side of policy management. Um, and then we're going to uh, get into like, what are some examples of policies? So that way we, when, we're, when we're talking about the modern way, we can think about what those mean, um, gives us something uh, to go along. I'm going to kind of talk about how to implement modern uh, pr uh, policy management. And then providing everything goes good, I'm going to demonstrate it in three, three different methods that we're going to do. So I did this, uh, this talk a couple weeks ago, and I didn't have the little demo god thing there, and it, it actually blew up on me. So I figured I'll put it back in. So <laughs> fingers crossed, it works. All right, so just a quick poll. How many of you guys uh, enjoy hearing the word policy management? We got one person from legal, probably. <laughs> one person from security. Yeah. So when I pitched this idea to my company, I said, I really want to talk about policy management. They're like, you got to be kidding me. They, they said, there's, like, they gave me 15 other ways to, to talk about something different. I said, no, I really think that policy management is what we're going to be talking about for the next you know, two years. Because we now have software and the ability to, to do something with it. So policy management is not a sexy topic. So if everybody has a beer, you know, we'll, we'll get through this together. So that's why I got mine. So let's start off with the definition of a policy. So a policy is a, is a deliberate uh, series of principles and uh, decisions uh, that you want to achieve a, uh, um, a rational outcome. Uh, this, it's basically put together in a statement, and it becomes a, a procedure or protocol. It's important to note that policies themselves are business decisions. They're not, they're not rule of law. And that's often one thing that we tend to forget. We hear something that happens, uh, and you have to do these things because it's a policy. No, it's a business decision to actually implement a policy. So that's important. That'll come in later when we start talking about it. So we talked about what is the anatomy of a policy. So a policy generally has about six different items that, uh, that are attributes that are required in order to define a good policy, or should. First one should be purpose or intent. What are you doing this for? Another should be actors. So who are the primary and secondary actors, maybe tertiary? Who, who, uh, who has to participate in these, these policy? Um, talk about the responsibilities of each of those people in a policy. Um, they should be bounded by some sort of a date. And uh, again, we'll get into that in a little bit more when we talk about refreshing. But it's, a, it's important that policies have some sort of an effective date. Um, you need some way to measure an effectiveness. If you just say a policy is something vague and you can't measure it, it's not a policy. It's a hope and a dream. So those are things you can't write software for, not yet. ML might help somebody in the future. All right. um, and then uh, last bit is you need to have some sort of a scope. So a policy needs to be defined within some sort of a context or within some sort of a scope. So when defining policies, we have to start thinking, we, we need to think about what is the agility of the policy. So things happen all the time. Your company gets acquired, governments change, new politicians come in, uh, the industry de develops new software, there's new ways about going things. Uh, policies need to be adaptable and need to be changed with the times so you don't end up with some of like the, 
weird laws that, you know, in the U.S. there's a law in the middle of uh, Oklahoma City, you can't walk an elephant down the street. It's not entirely useful because, well, I don't think anybody in Oklahoma has an elephant. So anyway, uh, policy, uh, policies need to be updated. And so they need to be designed uh, for extension and composition. So when you're thinking about a, a, a putting together a policy, how are you going to extend it and change it? What is the life cycle that needs to happen? You need to be able to test it. Can you test what your enforcement is of your, of your policies? Um, we need to start moving away from the idea of regulate and forget and turn into more of a responsive and iterative. This means that we're listening to feedback and we can make changes to our policies as we move forward. And last, uh, last I'll mention on this is uh, we also want to try to get away from like a binary uh, thought process. Uh, most of the time with a lot of our policies, it's not, it is this or it's not this. There's a lot of time there's a, a spectrum in which we do uh, uh, policy management. We need to have accountability for, or account for the changes that can happen within policies. And so it's nice to think about uh, policies as being algorithms uh, and therefore you can uh, then make them a little bit more flexible. So as an algorithm choice, uh, as an example, would be if you're working with Terraform, you can uh, put together a policy that's, or uh, put together a series of policies that say, how big is my change gonna be? What is the impact? And so you can look, if you're changing global networks and you're dropping databases and it's in a production environment and all that, that's a pretty hefty change. And so you probably wanna have an algorithm that goes through and says, what is a quantification of that? And then is, my, is it above or below my policy limit that I wanna have? so you can prevent it and force people to make more granular changes. That's just an example, there's, there's tons. So policies end up in three different major categories, um, at least from technology. I'm not gonna get into HR and those policies and definitely nothing with legal because I don't, I don't know those things. I find out about them after the fact when I do something wrong. So um, uh, they fall into three. So uh, first one, I talk, we'll talk about each of these individually, uh, but the first one is uh, solution protection. Um, and uh, then there's a security and regulatory and compliance. Uh, at any given time, a lot of these policies kind of overlap with each other. They're not always black and white. It's not always one of the three. So a lot of the time you'll see security and compliance do have similarities between them. But I do like to try to group them uh, separately because they have different actors. Um, they also have different people who have responsibilities for creating them and then um, uh, making sure that they, they, they work. So regulatory and compliance, a regulatory and compliance categorization uh, is intended to increase the you know, legal, industrial, regulatory uh, uh, compliance of your, of your uh, system, or, or at least of your company. So a lot of these will be things like, like examples of your data must reside in the EU region, or it must reside in a specific country. Um, GDPR is a good example of another type of a regulatory uh, uh, piece. Sometimes contractual, being legal, Sometimes you'll go to customers or you'll sell something. I'm sure if, if you've worked on any code, you've had this where sales have said, hey, we went and did this thing, we have, to, we have to have it in. If it's a policy, you have to build it in. You have to validate that it works. Um, you need to use policies to, to make sure that, that that is accounted for and you can show your customer that the, uh, the product that they specifically featured is there. So uh, next categorization level is what I call solution protection. And this is where, since we do mostly DevOps, this is where most of us live in, and this is largely our responsibility um, as, uh, as technologists and technology leaders in our company. Solution protection is the uh, policies intended to support health, stability, and reliability um, of, this, of this solution. So these are things like resource limiting uh, requests. You don't wanna have your system, you know, we were talking Kubernetes earlier, if you don't have any limitations whatsoever, you don't wanna give up control to your developers to say, oh sure, you know, our nodes are, you know, 16 core, I'm gonna throw a pod that's 16 core. You'll start like starving your system and then you have to you, you use that. So these policies are generally intended to try and uh, increase the stability uh, and the reliability of your system, which is ultimately the main goal that we wanna have. A um, couple other examples you can look at, you can see them on there. Um, requiring backups, enforcing, um, um, uh, reducing uh, frequency of changes, um, and requiring observability, requiring labels. So oftentimes our tools that we use to build to identify problems are based on labels. You can reject things that come into your system or try to be deployed if they don't have particular types of uh, attributes on them. Um, there's, you, your mind's probably going crazy. There's a ton of things you can do. All right. So last, uh, last categorization that I'll talk about is uh, security. So in security, uh, it's intended to be, or, or policies are intended to prevent unintended use, exposure, or extraction of information. 
Um, and so that's why this is different than um, uh, legal. Oftentimes, if you let something go and it goes out, then it is illegal. But um, this is the intention here to uh, proactively think about making sure your system does not have vulnerabilities. So this might be forcing MFA or, or two-factor. Um, this might be uh, looking at authorization. So um, uh, authentication is something that happens pretty easily. Everybody's got SSOs. Um, we, we can do those. but. Authoriz authorization is often very difficult to do, and, uh, and there's not a lot of systems, or they're very disparate. And so you can use policies to help manage those things. Um, you can also, another great one is in enforcing TLS. If you have uh, policies that are hooked up and, and touching your networks, you can enforce that. It will never come out as not being a TLS or something. So just as kind of some examples. So then, if we have a whole pile of, of uh, policies, how do, we, how do we manage them? So policy management is the process of creating, communicating, and maintaining the policies within an organization. And I highlighted, uh, highlighted very specifically creating, communicating, and maintaining. Uh, because we'll talk about communication in a minute. But communi communicating these is actually very, uh, not very easy to do. Um, and then maintaining, of course. So why do we use tools? So we have to use tools because at some point in time, you're going to have hundreds, maybe even thousands of policies from big to very granular. How do we, what do we need to do? them? First thing I like to say is when we have policy management um, uh, tools that we're using, it proves that the compliance is happening. If we have some sort of record that says we've, uh, uh, we've adopted and, and maybe some measurement skill uh, capabilities of that. Another is human, humans, we suck. We're, we're not good at remembering these things. We're not good at making sure they happen. So having a tool offsetting all of the effort that it takes and allowing the decisions to meet somewhere else by, by the people who are domain experts and they care about the policy. As a developer, you don't. You just want to make sure that the right decision is made. That's a better way to go about it. Often there's a lack of knowledge. Um, and I'll get, I, actually, I think I get into right here. So um, lack of knowledge. So you have a policy makers uh, are oftentimes, uh, I'll try to be nice because of this might be, this is being recorded. So and security people, I don't want to piss them off. Um, but oftentimes, security individuals don't go to school for computer science, or they don't go to school for, for operations. They, they uh, go to school for what does a policy mean? What does security mean? You know, we get CISSP, they get these certifications, and then that ends up in a big pile of uh, checklist. And so when they're talking to you and they say, well, you're not following the rules here, um, you know, something's not being done, they may not know how the system is being operated. And so you have to educate them um, and as to like, how you can come up to the same uh, solution without having a dictated uh, implementation for you. So um, that's another, I guess, a big thing. How many of you guys have read Phoenix Project? Awesome. If you haven't, go pick it up. They have it in multiple languages, in hardback, in audiobook, ebook. It's an awesome book. Um, it's one of my favorites. In there, there's a guy named John. He's the security officer. And he, just I'll, I'll clue you in, if you read it, you'll, you'll hear it. But he basically gets all pissed off because he has his black book box. And he walks around and he's like, writes all these policies. And uh, yet he's not a developer. He's not a part of it. He's way outside of the whole team. And he just gets angry the entire time because none of his policies are being handled. A lot of it is just the interaction. And when I get to the uh, policy portion of the modern, we'll, we'll talk about specifically of that. But, nice, but needless to say, those are the typical what we see right now in policy management. So let's look at uh, a little bit more into the adherence uh, and enforcement of policies. So right now, adherence of policies often are being done with projects. Uh, so new requirements come in. How many of you guys had to work on GDPR? Because that's, I mean, yeah, I think everybody probably, it's kind of a dumb question to ask here. Um, but uh, that's one of the things, right? Uh, how many guys was that a project? Did you say this is actually an initiative? We have project, we have resource together. That's generally how most of the policies get put in place. Second ends up being a lot of it is word of mouth. Um, we have temporal issues with the word of mouth. So a uh, new policy comes in. Uh, I, I'm guessing very few people have actually read every single page of what GDPR says it's supposed to do. You just know what your friend told you, who they learned from their friend, who learned from their friend. So it becomes tribal knowledge at some point in time, and there's not really an easy way to go about finding this. Um, and so it's, and it's temporal. Right now, I can guarantee almost nobody in this room is going to be like, hey, I can tell you all the rules that you have to have for that, because it, it was implemented two years ago. So we've lost that knowledge, and we don't care about it, because we've moved on to something way, way more fun. Um, <laughs> sorry, if that was your job. <laughs> My bad. Um, and then I, uh, to kind of go along with that word of mouth, uh, it's not to say that these things are not recorded. They're absolutely recorded. They generally get thrown into SharePoint. And you know once it goes into SharePoint, it's gone. So. <laughs> You might as well just delete it, because it's not going to be there. 
except for the people who write them. They keep checking to say how many people have read it. So, <laughs> All right, so then enforcement methods. I'm going to dig, dig, dig a little bit deeper into some of them in a moment here. But enforcement generally is done by outside teams, uh, at least for the bigger uh, type of compliance. Um, and so you know, it's not the delivery. It's not the operations. This is usually a third party company comes in. And again, like I said, they come in with a checklist. And they're like, you didn't do this. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it feels smug sometimes. And you don't want your baby to be called ugly. So it, uh, it, it's, it's not fun. So that's why that's another reason why policy management is just not a sexy topic. Um, outside uh, vendors uh, for your company end up being usually expensive and they're, they're lengthy engagements. Uh, they can last for, for months at a time um, just to, to get something. Um, if they're not from an outside agency, they're often ad hoc. So it's, it's done at just random times. Your boss went to a meeting and came out and said, by the way, the hot topic today is this, and now all of a sudden you're having to prove compliance of something that you had just heard of just now. So um, those things are, are uh, usually, you know, it's, it's difficult. And the last bit is there are a lot of software that's been around for you know, 15, 20 years that just scans your code or scans your ports, scans your systems. Those are all reactionary. So they're all post-delivery. That's usually something that goes out into an environment, um, hopefully not even production, but at least somewhere. And so it's already been implemented. And we all know that once you've impl implemented something, it's incredibly difficult to get that to be removed uh, or to be changed. So a lot of the challenges, I'm not going to read all through them, but a lot of the challenges kind of boil it down. Lack of knowledge is a really big part of it. Late life cycle, um, we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, let's see, uh, having historical legacy is very difficult to, to manage and remember. Um, and oftentimes, you're not testing these, these uh, policies. So when, when do we typically enforce policies? We typically will either do it at two points in time if we're not doing the ad hoc. You'll do it up front, and there are some pros and cons. So up front. Uh, generally is where you have a project, you sit down, you think about it, and you say, here's what we need to add into our system, and here's why, here's the 50 different policies. Um, it can be actually really beneficial for architectural requirements if you need to think about, so think about the data. If it has to stay in EU, well, you're going to design your system to make sure that it does. So they can be very ben beneficial. Um, it's also a great way to spread information for everybody who's on the team at that point in time. Um, it can also be very, uh, some negatives can be uh, that it often creates draconian rules. So uh, as a good example, that would be every single line in, or every single project has to have you know 95% line coverage and you know 80 85% branch coverage. You know that's largely impossible for most software companies to do, and it often creates just massive overhead and extra work that's not always needed. Um, and so you end up getting those types of things that come in. So uh, you get the the end. We can enforce policies towards the end of it. Well, that actually, I tried to come up with good reasons for that. And I said, at least you know what the patterns of your system look like. But I quite honestly can't come up with any good reason why you try to do policy management uh, uh, enforcement at the end. So there is none. Uh, but there's a ton of really negatives. Everything from rejecting work early, um, high cost. So, And I, uh, I can guarantee everybody can look for themselves and say this, but every time that you develop software at the very, very end of a project, you don't actually go back and refactor it the way it probably should have been done. You have your bosses and bosses and bosses all breathing down your neck. You write the quickest thing that will solve the problem. And now we start creating more pyramids of crap on top of crap. So that's what we do. And we create technical debt. So uh, into completion is uh, it's not a good place to put it. So before I get into the modern, uh, how we saw this from a modern perspective, um, I want to talk a little bit about responsibilities. So responsibilities, we have quite a few different actors in software that we work with. Uh, we have security engineers, and they're largely looking at what could be uh, uh, increased for security, what could be those things. We have IT administration or IT leadership. They're, honest, they're, they're oftentimes accountable for enforcing the policy management. Uh, and you'll see that that creates a problem in a moment. Um, we have leadership of uh, technical. We have developers. Developers do the work. Project owners take the policies and turn them into something that should be actionable. A uh, legal team really assesses the risk. So when I first started talking about policies, and I mentioned that it's a business rule, the reason why I say that is because a legal team needs to look at the assessment of that and say, is it OK? So you as a company could say, well, we're not going to adhere to GDRP. Um, we're just not going to do it. Well, there's legal implications for that, but you don't have to do it. If you get caught, you're going to look like uh, you know Marriott and those guys, and they're spending millions and millions of dollars trying to get out of that trouble. But legally, you don't have to do it. You can, uh, you can, you can pay the cost or, or whatever. So anyway, so with the responsibilities, I, I highlighted this pretty heavily before, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But you do have technical gaps that happen with these, these policies or these, I'm sorry, these uh, silos that happen when creating the policies. Um, 
Oftentimes they're done with without technical knowledge or with limited or even uh, older or archaic. So when you know we when we're now we're now in the new age where we can create ephemeral systems. They can be on for a shortened period of time, and they're dead when we don't need them anymore. And that policy, uh, the policy management CISSP and, and a lot of those organizations are slowly keeping up with how technology is done. I can guarantee everybody in this room doesn't want to write software like you did five years ago. Like we progress because we want to. So these silos end up creating uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, conflict uh, when we um, when when we have to address them. Let's see. Um, and the last bit that I feel like with the silos also is that um, oftentimes things get uh, misinterpreted. So when, I, when the IT team or the operations team is responsible or accountable for making sure the policies are adhered to and they have no control into how the delivery happens, that's an instant, instant uh, confl uh, confliction point in time. Uh, the wall of disillusionment and all the other kind of stuff that goes along with it. So we've moved on from that, hopefully. All right, so to kind of sum things up, accountability, responsibility are difficult with uh, divisions of teams and silos. Uh, policies are difficult to find and not actionable. Um, SharePoint is not actionable at all. Um, late changes increase uh, risk and conflict, um, and it's difficult to prove your compliance. So how do we solve the problem? I don't have all the answers, so this is just one, one way. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that up front so expectations are low. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dive real quickly into modern software delivery um, is a big key to how we solve this. We've evolved as an, as an industry and we've evolved as a technologist uh, to change the way, the, the delivery patterns in which we work. So there's a new concept, well, somewhat new, it's about four or five years old, called shifting left. And the idea is if we, uh, if we take a look at like what a waterfall used to look like, um, everything, you know, Looks left uh, was like the, you know, it started out with a design and then went into uh, architecture work and then development and then test, et cetera. Shifting left is the concept of pulling all those guys back into all those different stages back into one team. And so you're collating, uh, co-locating your teams or at least having the responsibility of one actionable team. And it's important that up until now, we haven't had legal as a part of that or compliance as a part of that. Wait, did I just go to, one second, sorry. Apparently it's nighttime. This work good. Okay. All right. I guess it, it is a little bit darker. Okay. So, um, so teams' responsibilities are changing. So on the left-hand side of the slide here, I kind of talk. It's it's a very 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 loose uh, representation of what things used to look like, uh, and perhaps maybe it still does in your organization. But we all want to be to that right side. Left-hand side is uh, uh, very uh, IT ticket oriented. So you have very big silos. You often get a matrix organization. When a project happens, they're like, "I'll loan you this person for a certain amount of time." It doesn't mean they're actually going to be a domain expert. Doesn't mean that they have the knowledge, but they're just loaned to the team for a period of time. So with that, we have tremendous bottlenecks that end up happening. So when we shift left uh, the, the responsibilities, we form uh, self-governing teams and uh, teams that can be uh, self-service. And instead it flips the, the operations is now the operations is there to enable the development teams, not as a bottleneck and it makes everybody much happier. So I put it at the very top there, security is now being, uh, should be brought into that. So we go back to uh, continuous delivery. I, I truly believe that continuous delivery still is the fundamental thing that needs to happen with every single system. It, it will indicate whether you have success or, or not within your system, uh, with any code you write. So having a CICD, looking at a, uh, um, this very fairly basic looking uh, pipeline here, uh, I want to point out that the feedback loop that always goes back to the beginning is probably the most important part. So the new parts that I'm going to introduce next here, at the top right there, you'll see security audit, compliant audit. Uh, they don't actually have to be those words or anything. You can make them whatever you want. But it's the idea that in, in a part of our pipeline, we can now start adding policy management um, and policy checking. Because what I really want to do more than anything is I want to know if my software is going to uh, violate compliance. So we started out, uh, I'm old. So I started a long time ago where we didn't have this. I used to drop files into a folder and then go home. And the next day, someone would say, hey, things didn't compile. I was like, oh, OK, well, that sucks. Um, we didn't know that. And so we said, hey, we found this thing called Hudson. And we're like, all right, we'll start using this CI. That sounds great. And then from the CI, we started having instantaneous compilation. And so we at least knew the code compiled and roughly ran some tests at the time. Progress time go further. We say, well, let's go ahead and start adding some automation into that. And can we, can we now deploy this to an environment with automation? And then we say, can we take that one step further? Because now we have enough uh, trust in the tests that we have, we have enough trust in the way that we built our software um, and that we progress all of our, our uh, applications through uh, the pipeline and we promote them, let's go straight to production. So continuous deployment. 
And then at this point in time, by the way, security is still out and uh, operations is out, or sorry, security is out and legal is out. So now um, DevOps is the idea that, hey, uh, operations, let's bring you into this as well. Let's start saying, can we uh, make our, our infrastructure the way we want it to do with code? And uh, we will control it as a team um, and, and make sure it's repeatable. Now security said, hey, we're still the last person who can fail, uh, can fail a build at the end of the day by saying it's not legal, this can't go out, or, or we're gonna breach software. So we bring security in. And so the concept of DevSecOps was kind of uh, born. And this is where we use uh, security uh, checks all across the entire pipeline. So at the very, very end here, I didn't have a name for it, so I just called it a delivery ecosystem because DevSec sec, uh, compliance ops just doesn't sound cool. So we're adding too many words together. So uh, that don't, don't take that as being anything useful. It's just Maybe it's a term, I don't know. Anyway, uh, largely what we're doing is we're now gonna bring compliance back into that because what I wanna know is if I'm building my software, um, I wanna know from the moment I commit my code, is this gonna violate a policy? So if I'm building a, 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 a I don't know, say a, a, a database and it resides in the US and our policy says it has to be in the EU, I don't want it to get all the way to production or somebody find it and say, hey, this is bad. I wanna know the moment I commit a code. If you do that on a feature branch, maybe it never even makes it to the master. And that's, that's where we want that fast feedback. So um, the idea, uh, as I just described, is we want to start bringing uh, uh, policy management into our CICD pipeline. Uh, policy management is a layered approach, means that we're going to apply something at every single different uh, position within the CICD pipeline or every uh, um, phase of the pipeline. So building is pretty simple, but testing could be something like, hey, we'll reject a build if it doesn't have a certain code coverage, or if it has linting errors, or something along those lines. Um, acceptance tests, obviously, if they fail, or you have a certain number of fail, uh, all the way up through the different types of uh, security, using BDD security, or Gauntlet, or uh, Veracode, or something like that. If there's ver uh, violations in there, or of a certain type, let's fail that build. So modern policy management uh, needs to focus on two, two primary ways to be able to make this happen. I actually have them backwards. I usually do the bottom one first. So digital, uh, it needs to be digital and it needs to be actionable. We need to have something where your policies are written in code or written in such a way that I can then interpret it by a machine. And so uh, the concept uh, uh, in a moment here, we'll, be, we'll talk about policy as code. Uh, the, co the policies need to be testable as well. So just like any code you write, you want to be able to use uh, uh, testability for it and make sure that it, uh, it does exactly what it says it's supposed to do. Uh, extensible and flexible, and of course, uh, hitting all three major uh, technical uh, um, categories that we want to work on. So now in order to do that, we need to start thinking about, we could take all of that and pack it into an application and then repeat the same thing in a different application, repeat in a different one. That's not how we do software. So instead, what we need to do is we need to start thinking about distributed decision making. And so it's where I can have a policy that sits outside. I can ask the system, is this okay? Based off the context information I have, it says yes or no, or unknown, which is actually a third state. But uh, I won't get into that. Um, anyway, um, and what that does is it also provides transparent policies. At any point in time, I should be able to go in as a developer and say, give me all the policies. I just want to see what they are. And so when I'm writing my software, it now becomes a point where I can view them. I don't have to go to SharePoint. I go to one spot, and maybe you have them in a hierarchy of some sort, but you should be able to uh, go look for them. So some tools. Um, I'm going to talk about this one first. Um, I have another slide that I think has like 20 different options on it, but this one is uh, probably the most flexible. This is called Open Policy Agent. Um, Open Policy Agent is a uh, CNCF incubating um, application right now or, or system. And uh, what it is, is it's a distributed uh, decision-making engine. And it's very generic. That's literally about all you have to say it is. So what it does is in my diagram, you can kind of see you have different types of data that might exist that you can use. You can push it to a service and then bundle that up and then push those all to different agents that sit right next to where the decisions need to be made. And the reason they do that is for performance purposes. And so there are some caveats. They do have some external queries and stuff. But for the most part, the base of how you want to work it push your stuff into memory, have very, very fast uh, responses. Because if you're having this as an authorization uh, component as a part of an API, you don't want to query another system, wait, have the query back, and incur the cost of a round trip to another system with a, de a delivery. You want to try to keep that as close to the edge as possible. Um, the way the code is written for Open Policy Agent um, is a syntax language or a query language called Rego. Um, I don't have a lot of great things to say about it, but um, I'm getting better. Uh, I've, I, spent, I spent the weekend working on it more. It's, it's growing on me slowly. Um, Rego is a, uh, was derived from uh, Datalog, which was derived from Prolog. So if you're old, you know what that is, and you're like, uh, 
So they try to modernize a little bit, uh, but let's say uh, the best way to say it, it's not a programming language per se, it's a query language. And so if you understand it from that perspective, then it makes it a lot easier to work with uh, because you understand how it's, uh, uh, that you're, you're always querying something. There's not functions necessary, there are, but there's not really the way you write it. You write it as being uh, declarative formats. All right, so just as an example, I'm just gonna give a real brief example of this, and when I get into my demonstrations in like three minutes here, um, I'll, uh, I'll show a little bit more. But this would be like an example of what a Rego file might look like. And so you, at the very top, you have OPA examples. Um, when I go to query the server, or I go to query the local agent that I have, I can actually use that as my packages and, and then encapsulate other policies that are in the same uh, uh, kind of uh, grouped area. And so everything in examples should be examples, so. Um, some of the, th uh, the key things, all the lines in that public servers, that public servers is the actual policy name. Um, the server, that object right there that you see, uh, that's both an input and an output, which makes me kind of grimace, but it's okay. Um, they know what they're doing. And then uh, the next several lines there, the key thing about Rego files is that every single line has to be true in order for the entire thing to be returned true. So assignments are, are automatically inherently true. Um, equals equals will check for uh, uh, conditional uh, uh, equality, et cetera. So as long as everything's true, the policy comes back as being true. Um, one, one small piece, um, if you, uh, when using these, uh, there is the third state, which is the undefined, meaning that if you return that back and it's not explicitly false, but it's also not true, you'll get back a, uh, a response that says uh, undetermined. And that can actually be useful when all you really care about, it does something happen, I don't care if it's false or not, or I do care that it's false, or I do care it's true, it's the in-between state. So it could be useful. Um, and then the last bit of it too is it does actually have a programming, uh, it does have a unit test as well. So I'll be demonstrating that as one of the demos. All right, so what policy agent is not? Uh, sorry, I grew up in Colorado in the US and we have what's called the silver bullet. Uh, the policy, open policy agent is not a silver bullet. Um, it does have uh, some limitations in that a lot of it might be the data. So if you're dealing with petabytes of data, so say you, you want to query to see, uh, does somebody report to somebody else and allow something if it does? If your uh, database is you know, several terabytes large of that, you're not gonna hold that in memory. That's not a really good example of how you could use it. You might wanna actually take that data, coalesce it down into something much smaller, and then send that package out more frequently to, to keep updates so it's a, more of a proxy. Um, it's not super simple syntax, and it will take you quite a bit of time to uh, get through it, and I'm going bald still, and it's getting worse because of it. So Rego's not the easiest thing to work with. Um, also, uh, it's not used for authentication. It's used for authorization, but not authentication, and that's important. It's important to not overuse the tools uh, for something that might be a better choice. So best practices uh, for using it. Um, it's a, a great idea to implement this with a CI/CD uh, pipeline always. You can run it locally, but, you can, but it's much, much better to have a system run it. So make sure the policies and everything work locally and then have the CI actually run the rest of the work. Um, do not overwrite uh, other tooling, and I had mentioned that. So you're not writing a uh, single sign-on, you're not writing something that's gonna go do that. Let, let those tools do the, their job. Only focus on just the decision-making portion of it alone. Um, at the very bottom, test, test, test. It's very important that you can prove that your tests work. Okay, so Open Policy Agent isn't the only one, but what I have found is Open Policy Agent is the most generic of all the different tools. This isn't comprehensive, there's, I'm sure there's tons more, especially paid versions of things which I don't usually get to see. So these are mostly open source. Um, but what I've noticed with uh, Open Policy Agent is that it's generic enough that it will, do th it will help you decide, make decisions before you make the code commit happen to a master or something along those lines, which I find is way more powerful than waiting until something goes out. Now, as a part of that, Things like network policies are a great way to, to you know, control policies for networks. OpenShift has uh, their own policies, but then again, it's proprietary to working with OpenShift. Uh, Terraform Sentinel, um, which is their enterprise version, they have that, but again, now you're only with uh, Terraform, you're not working with anything else, and you know, the list kind of goes down. A Couple cool ones in there I wanna mention. Cloud Custodian at the bottom, if you haven't seen that tool, it's really cool. Um, it works great, again, for a post fact after something's gone out, uh, but it allows you to basically query the whole system and say, here's my policies I want to put in place, am I adhering to them? So it's maybe, maybe you could use them both in conjunction and have some sort of a uh, reconciliation that says, I, I said I wanted to do it, and it shows I actually did do it. Um, 
And actually, I put the bottom one on there, OS query, because that's how I actually started this whole uh, uh, venture about a year ago. I was sitting on an airplane and I said, hey, there's gotta be some way that I can, I can make sure that um, I know what my system's doing and not doing and how much I have and everything. And so I, I went around and OS query was written by Facebook. It runs as an agent and you just, you could put it as a sidecar or whatever, but it basically reports back a whole bunch of information. And then you can just query it like you do SQL and say, give me everything where, I don't know, uh, Docker's running or something like that. And so I was hoping to build it off of that and found out that OPA exists. And I said, good, I don't want to rewrite something. So, all right, so here comes the fun part. So I'm gonna drink this quick beer. Okay, so the first thing I want to demonstrate here is I want to demonstrate uh, what the um, unit testing looks like. And there's kind of two different ways you can go about it. There's the built-in unit test, and then you can also do like a real live evaluation uh, as though it would be running in a production environment. Um, that real live, whatever, the eval, um, takes a little bit of extra effort to, uh, uh, to make sure that your validation was correct, but, uh, and you have to be make sure you don't do something that's very brittle like you would with a, uh, a browser level test or something. Same sort of rules apply, it returns back JSON or something. Don't write it such that you will break it by changing your functionality. So, that all being said, here comes the fun part. Oh, shoot. Oh no, I didn't realize that. Oh no, okay, that's not gonna work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, mirror my screen, so just give me a moment here. There's no way that I wanna try to do that and look at that screen. Okay. And by the way, I'll have these all shaped up and out there. Um, hopefully everyone can read that. Uh, hopefully, actually, I, I hope you can actually see this. So it was more of a joke, but this is, hopefully you can actually see this. So on the left-hand side here of my screen here, um, it's a whole bunch of junk, but let's just say, I'll, I'll make it as simple as possible. I have one particular rule that I'm going to call, it's called has, ad, uh, has admin. So I'm, I'm querying to see uh, in the request that I'm sending to it, does it have an admin? Um, there is a special input uh, that's defined for all Rego that will always say input comes in with the word input. You can rename it, do other stuff if you want to, but for simplicity's sake, I kept it as that. Um, then from there, it's just JSON. So I'm looking at all the people, and for each person, I wanna see, do they have the flag is admin, is that equal? Um, and then I wanna grab that name and just make an assignment for it. I'm only doing that just to show that I can do an assignment that's not super useful um, in, in the real world. So on the right-hand side, I have uh, my test cases. And so what I can do is I can take, let me get the actual one here. This mock admin right here is the actual uh, query that I'm gonna push in. And so what I'm looking at, you'll see people, name is admin. You can see I have two objects that are in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to run this. This test by convention has a, a forward slash or a, a test underscore prefix. That's how Rego knows that it's a test. Uh, I'm not gonna go into best practices. You should probably put this in its own folder and you should probably have naming conventions and you, know, you can probably control it with some bash files and there's a whole bunch of stuff you could do to make this thing uh, very, very smooth. But for our sake, we're just gonna keep it simple. So I'm calling the policy has admin and I'm saying my input is this mock admin that I have created. So if this works, uh, run test test, or I guess I should have done it from the command line. We'll see how the presentation works. All right, and that's, that's the whole output you get four test pass, because I actually have four tests in there. So in this case, I'm not running in verbose mode. Verbose mode will give you a little bit more about the decision. And then there is a super verbose mode that will actually tell you how each of the different individual lines actually worked out for all of them. Um, this is an incredibly simplistic version of what a policy might look like. So um, my intention wasn't to go super deep into how that all works, but to show that this is a best practice. And now in my CICD pipeline, when I go to commit this, I can always run a test against all my Rego files and my test files and validate and make sure that I'm not changing a policy or if a, ch a policy was changed, I can, I can uh, handle it. So that is demo number one and that one actually worked. So that's good. All right. So ideally, this, like as I mentioned, ideally this would be pushed to a continuous integration environment. Um, and then from that point on, if you're doing continuous deployment, uh, it would then push it out to the actual server uh, or to the different uh, agents that work on. Now this one is probably way sexier and way more fun. This is Terraform. So now in Terraform, the example I'm gonna give is that I want to create a, uh, um, a Terraform plan that uses Europe, uh, Europe North One, I'm using Google in this example. Um, and then I'm gonna create the same plan, but use it at US uh, West. Um, and so, sorry, one second here. 
Oops. I didn't have this down to the point where I could just. Is that all I want? Yeah. Actually, I'm going to open this one too. Okay, back into presentation mode here. Okay, so this is what my Rego file looks like. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm just defining some regions that uh, my code can work in, uh, my, my system can, can deploy to. Um, I am setting a default. So in this case here, ambiguous is not good. I want to, uh, undetermined is not good. I want to know if this is a positive or a negative. And so then I'm going to look at this and say, um, the information is passed in, my, my plan that I'm passing in, I want to check, this is the Terraform font of it, is uh, getting down to the uh, JSON of it. Uh, there's an object called resource changes, and you want, I want to run through every single one of those, and then I want to see is there a change in action, and make sure that change is create. I'm only doing this on create. In the real world, you probably want to look at other mutations as well for updates and deletes, but again, I don't want to bloat the code for no reason. Um, there is this handy dandy little underscore thing. This guy says, I don't care what the variable is. It's, it's in an array, just I don't care. Just iterate through. So you're not recording it, whereas in this case, the I, I actually am doing that because that's my anchor. All right, so then I'm just gonna say, does the zone match the, anything in the zones that I have up here? That's it. So, oh, and I should probably explain here too. Um, I'm not gonna type out all the commands because nobody likes to do that. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I have a script file and I'm just gonna comment out two things. Um, I run Terraform plan against, uh, I'm passing in a very explicitly to overly show that I'm doing this from a different region. I'm passing in the zone and the region as being the one I want to see. Uh, Terraform show uh, is a command from Terraform that allows me to then transform that plan into a JSON file. Um, and then this is my little trickery to just get rid of the extra uh, quotes around it. And then I'm dropping that out to a plan. I'm gonna dump that out so you guys can see it. And then I'm gonna run OPA evaluation against the plan and the policy. Um, and then ultimately against the data Terraform uh, uh, is valid. So that being said, so this is running real live Terraform. I'm not applying the plan, of course. Yay. All right, so Terraform says it's gonna change four things. And then my output changes. Uh, can we see that? Is that okay? I just didn't ask about. All right. So Terraform says it does its four. If you work Terraform, you've seen that. And then my part here says um, it's going to run the results. And so here's the actual output of the body. If you want to ever see that or use it, you might be running multiple different policies at the same time. So you might have multiple different results. In this case here, the value is true. And then I just crib it and say it's true. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing, but instead I'm going to run it against an invalid form. Just rerun the same thing. And if this doesn't fail, then, well, I'll flip the table. And while it's running, I get beer. Yay, it failed. So you can see how powerful this would be when you put this into a continuous integration environment. And so allow your developers as much control as you want to give them. If you have these policies built in and every single plan has to go through this and you can expose that, you, get, you as an operator can say, I only want to see things that look like this. Maybe it's the size of disk that you use, it's regions, maybe it's disk, maybe it's uh, labels. Just about anything you can think of could go through this and you can write policy. And again, the developers can also get uh, some sort of feedback uh, as, as soon as they have it. I don't have a return value, but you could put a return value that would say, here's explicitly what, why it doesn't work. All right, now the last one, which since we talked about Kubernetes, um, is uh, the Kubernetes uh, admission controller. So we've taken care of the infrastructure at this point, we can manage that. Now the next where of what I'm calling the second wave of shadow ops is Kubernetes. Um, if you allow kubectl to uh, control to anybody, well, you're just gonna have databases put in there and, and every other piece of junk you can think of uh, because you're allowing it. And that's generally okay, let's put some governance into it. So what I'm gonna demonstrate here is that I'm gonna try to make a deployment that goes to the default namespace. I'm gonna make a rule using OPA that will uh, uh, pre prevent um, uh, the, uh, any deployment into the default namespace. Again, this could be just about anything you can think of, but in this case, I'm making this simple. So, one moment. And this is the last demo, I only, I only do three. All right. Okay. Come on. Okay. So um, a lot of this is uh, documented uh, fairly well within the, uh, the space um, for uh, online. 
Um, I will say that uh, this took me about five minutes of total time to set up, so the gatekeeper is super easy. I did it before when they had what was called the accepting web, uh, you could use an accepting webhook, and then, or the mutation webhook, and those, that one sucked. Um, but I did that before we actually ran your own pod, and then you had an attached pod that pulled in uh, OPA file or Rego files and then did all the jazz. That was a lot more complicated. So since then, about three months ago, they put out what's called gatekeeper, um, and now you're actually using CRDs uh, to make your definitions happen. Oh, that one's not the exciting one. Here's the, uh, the exciting one here, kind of. Uh, so basically it defines what a, uh, a, a resource is. In this case, we're calling it a, you know, a names required namespace. Uh, does its fun, fun jazz. Here's the actual Rego file. Um, I will say this is the one Achilles heel that I don't like, is that um, your, your, your definition is inside of the CRD. Um, or inside of the template that you create rather than having it as an external file. So testing it's a lot more difficult. Um, that being said, you can automate the creation of one of these if you really want to. So in this case, what we're doing is you can see I'm uh, putting into a package called required namespace and then um, the input, I'm looking at the review object, metadata, namespace, um, setting that value that I'm checking to see if it's against default. Um, and so again, if this is true, I want, it, uh, I want something to happen. So it's gonna default to, to a failure if that's true. So. Um, Sometimes in logic, you have to think the opposite rather than the, the affirmation, think of the negative, and then, that, uh, and then look for the negative of the negative, and that's your, your answer. And that's confusing for me to even say. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to real briefly install the constraint. I'm going I'm to show that it's going to allow it. Then I'm going to install the constraint. I'm going to try and install it again and have it, have it fail, I hope. Okay, so. So keep still. Apply. Uh, demo. And of course, as long as the networks are up and going. So this first one here is just creating a, a demonstration of deployment. Uh, I don't explicitly have to do that, but so you can see that it's running, right? So, so we, we got that, so that's, that's all good. That's a Kubernetes 101. Okay, so now I'm gonna run the, uh, these, two, uh, these two new factors. So what do I call it? I'll just run it from there rather than run the commands. So it creates the namespace uh, of the CRD. Oops, I need to run them backwards, sorry. Just thinking. There we go, okay. So uh, now these are created. So now if I go back and I go to re rerun my deployment, uh, by default it goes to, to uh, uh, nothing. Now you see I, the exact same command fails. Hold on. Oh, too many, ah. Oh. Sorry, I didn't count. Yeah, that should be enough. So now you can see that the uh, policy uh, prevented the deployment from going into there. So now what I can do is I can run the same command, but do, um, uh, whoops, let me do development, because I think I have a development namespace. And now you'll see that it's created. And so now that's how I made a policy that prevented a something to happen within Kubernetes um, and uh, uh, just using these things. So. That's the whole fun of it. So, in summary, since I've used a lot of your guys' time and it's beer drinking time, so. Um, in summary, uh, uh, policies help to increase the uh, transparency and knowledge of your, of your policies. Um, it helps you find and remove solos or silos, or you should be trying to do that. Um, policies need to be actionable and measurable at the same time. Um, distributed decision-making, not distributed policy creation. I think that's very important. Um, uh, times change, software gets different, we get more efficient, we get better, we're even moving into a serverless world as much as we can. Uh, so start making sure you use that CICD pipeline as the, the anchor, or the, uh, the, the rock of your, of your implementation, get that fast feedback. Um, understand that responsibilities are changing as we shift left and development teams take on more and more responsibility and gain new members into the team, we have those. Um, and then the last part, policy management isn't a checklist. So make sure that you have a layered approach. You have multiple different tools that you're using to apply these, multiple different ways to measure them. Make sure that you're not doing them all up front and you're not doing it all, in the, all at the end. Those incur cost. Um, and the last piece is uh, policies are business decisions. So make sure you understand what the implications of adhering to those policies are. So that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you.